Hi, good afternoon. Today we are going to talk about a little bit of the LLC. Um, it's already five um, in its past. So I'm going to start with the design or let's say with the presentation of the LLC. It's gonna take me around 20 minutes, more or less, and then I will have some time for questions. So let's go. I'm gonna go back with the presentation. Okay, so um, the idea today is to, to present a practical design methodology for the LLC converter, or let's say the, the LLC transformer. Um, so let's go, I will cover the basic things of the LLC and I will just talk one minute on the state of the art uh, design methodologies. And then I will explain in detail um, where is the, the, the practical design methodology um, that I'm going to, to propose. So LLC converter, we have um, a resonant topology here where we have an input bridge where the idea is to do a frequency control where the, uh, to control the output voltage and the output power. Um, the, the objective of this uh, LLC converter is to have a very uh, high efficiency with zero voltage switching in the primary side switches, zero current switching at the turn off of the secondary diodes um, to have a very high power density. Now, here we have two magnetics normally, the one inductor and one transformer that could be either two components or an integrated component. I will talk about this uh, later. Now, if we look at the state of the art, um, there's been a lot of different design methodologies that has been proposed in the literature. Um, most of them are based on these four that I'm showing here, which are the area product method, RTH method, KG method, and the gap transformer method. So the first three are not specifically intended for the LLC itself, but they are rather, um, let's say, the considered for any transformer. Um, the idea is always to define uh, a certain uh, magnetic density flux that you want to have in the core, a certain current density, a certain uh, window utilization factor. Um, based on that, we get, uh, well, in the case of the area product, we get uh, the area product number and then looking at the cores, we can select the core. That's the basic idea. Um, in the case of the RTH, it's more focused on what temperature rise uh, you want to get. And then there is this uh, other uh, methodology proposed by Harley um, uh, some years ago, where the magnetizing inductance of the LLC is considered uh, together with the flux, the utilization uh, area, and the temperature rise. Now, what I will talk about today is a design methodology where we start with the specification of the converter. Then, so we will define, um, let's say the target of, of the transformer design based on the input and output voltage conditions, the switching frequency range, the magnetizing inductance, the tunes ratio, the leakage inductance strategy, whether we want to have it integrated or not, the temperature rise that we want to have on the ambient temperature. Then according to that, we will define the losses target of our converter, um, particularly of our transformer. Um, especially we will take a look at the operation range because the LLC has a wide frequency range and this should be considered. And with that, we will come up with a list of cores that we will later, uh, let's say, take or filter or, or analyze based on its temperature. And then we'll show you uh, how to do this. Um, and then from the list, of course, we will take a look at what, what is the impact of the magnetizing inductance? What is the impact of the power density, the available space we have? Um, so we can select a core. Um, and then we will go through the different winding strategies that we, uh, we can have to meet the leakage inductance or to minimize the losses. So let's go uh, one by one. So first of all is that we have to design a transformer. Um, if we have 
any power converter, we, we have a target efficiency always. And many times it's, it's not clear how much we should lose in the transformer. Um, but here you have a typical, uh, let's say, impact of the efficiency of the transformer or over the overall efficiency. The lower the power of the converter, like here we have 60 watts up to 100 kilowatt, the higher the impact of the transformer losses. This means that if I'm losing here, for instance, five watts, I might have one third in the transformer. So this means that the transformer represents 35% uh, of the losses. While, while when we move to very high power, uh, the transformer, let's say percentage uh, over the overall losses of the converter is much smaller. So the first thing that we should try to do is to, to understand what is the target loss for our transformer, um, especially in our, uh, in the whole operating range, okay? Um, then the second point is that we have an LLC. So this means that the uh, range of operation is quite wide. So this is an example for a typical uh, three kilowatts uh, LLC converter um, where the output battery goes from 200 volts up to 450 volts. So this means like in this case, this means that the switching frequency, because of how the tank has been designed, the switching frequency goes from 60 kilohertz up to 171 kilohertz. Now, why, why I'm looking at this, or why I want to point out this, is because, okay, we have a loss target in the um, transformer, but now we need to, to define how much of those losses should be in the core, and how much of those losses should be in the windings. Um, if you look at the at the magnetic design books, uh, they will always say that it's it's let's say the optimum thing is to have a 50% balance between the core losses and the winding losses, and this is true. Now the thing is, if we look at the LLC converter, uh, this is not possible always. Why? Because we have a wide operating range. So this means that when we are at very high frequency. Uh, the flux in the core is going to be too low. So this means that the core losses are going to be too low compared to the winding losses. So in this case, the core loss represents barely 1% over the total losses. Now, if we go to the other extreme, uh, to the low frequency range, um, the core losses in this, in this particular case represent 33%. So it is not, let's say in LLC, we cannot always consider 50% of balance and when we are defining the transformer loss target, we should look at what is the range of frequencies, the closer to unity. So if we have a very narrow range, then the 3% balance could be probably the best way to move. Uh, but if we are increasing the range and we have a much lower frequency, a much higher frequency, probably we should start looking at uh, a core loss of 40%, 30% um, a full load. Now, let's say out, let's say before, before arriving here, we have a target loss um, on our transformer and we have a target loss on our core. Now, we need to define which cores are available for our application. Um, to do so, we also need to, to, to define, let's say, which cores can handle the temperature. So there are Different ways to do this. One very simple way uh, is basically what I saw in the very uh, at the very beginning, which is that at the end we know the losses that we want to have in the transformer. We know the temperature rise um, based on the uh, RTH of the core. We can define that. The problem with this approach is that the these RTH that let's say ferrite suppliers provided provide is only I mean doesn't make any distinct any distinction between the winding temperature and the core temperature. So if you have most of the losses in the windings, maybe you are not getting the right uh, estimation or the proper accuracy. So one way to solve this problem is to have a thermal resistor network for each specific core. Now, how to do so, or what is, what is the idea here? The idea is that we can take a list, I mean, the, the list of cores available, we can predefine uh, winding uh, in each of those cores 
and then we can define the thermal resistor network for this structure. We can now define some core losses, some winding losses, and get the values of all these resistances of this thermal resistor network. So this means we are building a database of thermal resistor network for each of the cores available in the market. Now, once this database is constructed, we can go with our target core loss, our target winding loss, and our target temperature rise, and we can see what cores are falling out of or cannot meet the temperature requirement. So let me let me go through an example because maybe this is not uh, so clear or so straightforward. We are doing a design and we want to know um, if we have 2.2 watts in the core and 3.5 watts in the winding with uh, 80 degrees uh, temperature rise, what is gonna happen with a PQ40? So the first step that we are going to do is, okay, we have our database and to derive this database, what we have done is that we have filled the window, we have defined 70% of uh, let's say the coil filling factor. Um, to do so, we have defined four layers uh, in 40 turns in four layers with a wire of 1.95 millimeters. Now, in this case, we have considered three watts in the winding and 2.5 watts in the core. And according to this, we can get uh, our thermal resistor network for these two values. Now, the idea is that when I came to this thermal resistor network with whatever new values, I can get the estimation of the temperature. And this is exactly what we did here. So this means that now the temperature in the core is 79 degrees, the temperature in the winding is 96 degrees. This is a prediction. I have not done any design yet. This is with my new specification. Now, when I do the design, which is uh, where I'm showing here, the complete design, as you see, I have one primary winding in blue, one secondary winding in orange, um, in this case, the losses in the in the windings are 3.6 watts and the losses in the core are 2.2 watts. If I derive the complete and extensive thermal resistor network for this transformer, what I'm getting is that the surface temperature of the core is 80 degrees and the surface temperature of the winding is 100 degrees. If now we look back to the estimation that we did with this simplification, it's quite good. So let's say with this approach, we can get rid of those cores that are not able to meet the temperature requirement. So arrived to this point, we have a list of cores um, that are able to meet our temperature requirement based on our core loss target, and we have a winding loss target. Now, how to move on? The next thing we need to do is, based on this um, core loss target, and having the, let's say, inverse of the statements uh, equations, improve generalized statements equations, we can get how many turns we need in our core. So let's say I want the maths, uh, I have this core doing the reverse math, we can get, okay, I need then uh, 25 turns. So this is the first step, and we should do always this with the proper operating conditions. So this means at the worst case scenario for the transformer, which means at the lowest uh, switching frequency with the highest uh, input voltage. Now, here we have the turns, we have the core. If we have the proper reluctance model for each of these cores, we can also get the size of the gap. And it is very important to do this because many times in the LLC, we have a very specific magnetizing inductance requirement. And then uh, if we don't do this at this stage, maybe some solutions or some cores are not able to meet the inductance. So this means that if you need, for instance, 400 micro, maybe uh, with this specific core, you are not able to, to get that even without any gap. So this core should be already discarded. Or if the, the other way around, if I need a very low value, like imagine you need a 40 micro uh, magnetizing inductance, and then this means that the gap in this core is five millimeters. So then this makes no sense because just, the fringing field loss is going to be so high. So this is the, the, the second step that we need to do, which is get together the number of turns that are able that, let's say, meet the core loss requirement and the available um, and the gap associated to that number of turns. So we can discard the cores that are not able to meet the inductance requirement and the cores that are having a huge gap. That is one important thing that to do this, 
we need to predefine a material. We need to select the material of the of the core. Okay, this is one let's say decision that we need to do at this stage. Now, okay, arrive to this point. I'm gonna I'm gonna recap. We have a target in the core loss, target in the winding loss, a list of cores that are able to meet the temperature. That we have a number of turns and we have a gap size. Now we need to take out those cores where the wire will not be able to, to fit. Okay, so where the, 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 let's say the window will be too small to fit the wires. So how can we do this? Okay, we have an available window space, which is here, which is given by the size of the window area. So if this is the core, this is the coil former, this is the height of the coil former, this is the width, inside the window. So this is the available area that we have. And now we need to see if our wires fit or not. So some considerations that we need to take is first, what is our isolation strategy? Like there are basically three options. Well, probably there are more, but here I'm showing three options, which is um, whether you want to use margin tape. So this means that we are gonna put some margin tape at the sides of the coil former. So we should take this into account to take the window the available space. Um, the other option, we see, which is whether we want to use triple insulated wire. So this means that the nominal diameter of the wire is going to be uh, bigger because of the, the insulation thickness that we have in the wire. Or whether we want to have um, high leakage inductance in one transformer. And this means that we are going for a, a split bobbin strategy. So this means that we are separating the primary winding um, and the secondary winding. So this means we are putting here some uh, some material. In this case, is the coil former. We are putting, a, a, let's say, a separator here, and this takes a space. So all of these considerations has to be taken. So we really uh, take into account what is the available space in our window. Now, once we have this, the second point is, OK, how much space we need in our windings? So we know the turns, we know the current. Um, what, what I propose here is that first, we can define what is the current density uh, of our transformer that we are targeting. A uh, good rule of thumb is five amperes per square millimeter, but this number is used a rule of thumb. If you have a really good cooling, like you have a ported component or you have, uh, let's say, a significant amount of forced air, you can increase this number up to eight, 10, even 12 amperes per square millimeter. Um, based on this, we have a conduction area that we need. So if what we can do now is with this conduction area, um, we can define what is the strand diameter that we want. So let's, let's uh, how to do this. So again, here is a, a rule of thumb. If we are, we need to take a look at the skin depth and, and go for at least a couple of times smaller than that. So imagine we are working at 100 kilohertz, we could go uh, to 0.1 or 0.07 millimeters strand. So with these two, with the conduction area that we need and the strand diameter already defined, we can get the number of strands by a simple equation. And with this uh, strand diameter and number of strands and the porosity factor of the wire, we can get the output diameter of the wire. And since we know the turns ratio and we know the number of turns, now just doing some very basic math, we can get what is the total conduction area needed for our windings. If this conduction area is smaller than the available window area, then that core is not able to meet, let's say, the, the, it's not able to, to, to meet the, the minimum fitting uh, of the window. So that core can be discarded. Um, so let's say that arrived to this point, we have a list of cores that are able to meet the core loss target, the temperature target, the gap. I mean, we have the gap defined, we have the magnetizing inductance ensured, we have the number of turns in the primary and the secondary winding, and we know that they can fit in our window. Now it's time to select the wire of our magnetic, um, the, let's say, positioning of the windings. Um, so how to do that? What we need to ask ourselves first is, whether we want to have the leakage inductance integrated or not. Uh, if the leakage inductance is not integrated, or let's say, well, leakage, sorry, this is, uh, I didn't say the right words, where we want to have the in series inductor integrated as the leakage inductance of the transformer or not. 
So if we um, don't want to, to have it, so this means that we have two components, one separate inductor in series with the transformer, then what we are looking for is for an interleaving winding arrangement, like the ones I have here. So this is partial interleaving. I have all the primary um, in, I mean, in primary layer, then secondary, then uh, primary layer again, or uh, we can do a full interleaving arrangement, primary, secondary, primary, secondary. The good thing about this is that we will be able to minimize the uh, proximity losses and we will be able to have the lowest winding losses in our transformer and the lowest leakage inductance. So what we should do is check the losses. If these losses are bigger than um, our uh, target when they lost, then we should uh, modify it. Um, and so by adjusting the, the number of turns or by adjusting the, uh, the, the number of parallels or the uh, leads wire configuration. Now, if what we are looking for is for a integrated component where the series inductor uh, is integrated as the liquid, of the transformer, then there are different options. So the first thing I, I would recommend is to go for a split bobbing. So this means that you have all the primary in the top, all the secondary in the bottom. Um, the, the, the good thing about this is that you get, uh, let's say not very good coupling, so you can have high leakage inductance values. The bad thing is that probably the winding losses are going to increase a lot. So this means that the, the winding losses could not meet the winding target and maybe um, you need to go for a different type of uh, more complex structure like the ones on here. So this is a multiple chamber where we have half of the primary in the top, half of the primary in the, in the bottom, and then the secondary in between. So it's kind of uh, interleaving in the vertical axis. Um, and by doing this, we can also have a pretty high leakage inductance, but we have the benefit of some uh, cancellation of the proximity. So this means lower winding losses in our component. There is another option, which I saw here, which is if neither of these approaches is enough to get the leakage that you need, uh, there is an option to put some ferrite material in between the windings to increase the leakage flux and to increase the leakage inductance. This is not for free. I mean, this at the end, we are putting uh, ferrite materials or we are increasing the complexity uh, of the manufacturing, we're inc increasing uh, the complexity of the modeling and we are putting some losses here, but it's a very effective solution to have a higher leakage flux and a higher leakage inductance. I put here um, that this is a good solution for round center pole. So this means like if you have an EQ core, ER core, PQ core where the center pole of the core is circular because then you can use, use a ferrite toroid. But if you are using, for instance, an E-core, then a toroid would not be valid or not would be preferred. Um, so that's why I say this here, uh, but this is intended for toroids. It's a, a different ferry material is used. Round center pole could be also avoided and could be valid for any core. Um, and that's how the winding uh, could be, uh, let's say, considered and optimized, taking into account the leakage, uh, inductance and the winding losses. Now, so arrive to this point, it is important to say that this is an iterative process. So it's it's very likely to happen that uh, you have taken some decision here, like for instance, defining the material that is not the optimum one, and maybe uh, the core loss is not met or uh, the winding loss is not met or when you run everything together, it, let's say one of the, of the requirement is not met. So this is an iterative process. Um, so now, I would like to do a, a, a brief example. Uh, this is uh, a, com a LLC converter for 250 watts, where the input voltage goes from 18 volts up to 36 volts. The output voltage is fixed to 400 volts, and the efficiency target is of the converter is 96% at low power and 97.4% at high power. The magnetizing inductance is 12.2 micro and the series inductance is 2.2 micro. Switching frequency range goes from 50 kilohertz up to 117 kilohertz, and the resonance frequency is 110 kilohertz. In this case, the dimensions specified are 42 by 42 by 30 millimeters. Uh, there is no, uh, let's say, specific cooling, use pure convection, and the temp maximum temperature rise is 80 degrees. The target is to have a liquid inductance integrated and reinforced insulation. So here you can see, well, a brief 
a recap of how the waveforms look like. Um, if we go uh, on a step by step uh, procedure following the, the previous uh, uh, methodology, what we need to do first is define the target loss. So looking at the efficiency of the converter, those 96% at full power and 94.5% uh, at uh, reduced power, uh, we can get what is the, the target losses in the winding and core losses. Um, in this case, we have selected 65% of uh, let's say distribution of losses at light load because at light load more losses will be appearing in the core because we have less carbon than in the winding and this means that the um, this give us the the let's say here actually this is ground this is uh, not copper cu this is core co um, target um, so these are the core loss target and these are the winding losses target now if we feed that uh, in our uh, database of thermal resistor network, we can take out the cores that doesn't meet this 75 degrees requirement and 90 degrees requirement in the winding. Um, so in this case, I'm showing only the PQ, ETD, and E cores used for the sake of simplicity, because otherwise this graph won't probably fit even in this slide. So if we take this core loss target of 1.33 watts and this winding loss target of 1.25 watts, uh, in our database, what we see is that all these cores are not able to meet the, uh, let's say, the, the, the temperature requirement, and we cannot use them. Now, um, when we look at the when we look at the the third step was to understand how many turns we need and what is the gap, uh, the size of the gap. So this, uh, well, in frantic we can do it with what we call the core optimizer. So we get for each of these uh, specific cores what how many turns we need uh, for them. Um, and then uh, when we look at the fitting window, what we have defined is that the current density is six amperes per square millimeter. Uh, we have fixed the, the diameter of the singular strands to be 0.07 millimeter, and that we want to have a split bobbing. So this means that we are going to separate the primary and secondary winding by one millimeter. And this gave us uh, a requirement, our original requirement, or let's say first requirement to have a 2.2 millimeter wire in the primary and 0.6 millimeter in the secondary. And doing this and uh, looking at the previous um, previous graph, what we uh, see is that the uh, most of the cores are able to meet the fitting of the window, but there is uh, one core, which is the PQ3220, which is not able to fit the wire. So this one, we can take it out. Um, now, which, why, which core to select? It, this is a trade-off, whether you want to minimize losses, whether you want to minimize volume, or whether you want to minimize cost. In this case, we were seeking for the smallest component, so we looked for the smaller core, which is the E35 core. Now, um, this is the, the design. So we have all the primary in the top, all the secondary in the bottom to have a bad coupling, bad coupling between primary and secondary. In this case, we have used a lead wire with one cystic strands into 0.07. Seven turns, three parallel wires, and in the secondary side, 84 turns with a single wire of 30 strands times 0 0.07. The magnetizing inductance is 12 micro, and the leakage inductance is 2.17, which is very close to the to the let's say target requirement, which was 2.2 micro. Now, if we look at the performance at uh, nominal power, we are below the target uh, efficiency. So the target efficiency was to have 2.5 watts. But when we go to light load uh, 150 watts, because at this 18 volts input, we have 150 watts, um, we're a little bit exceeding the target loss, which was two watts. So we need to, again, we need to think, uh, we need to iterate and see what we did wrong. And in this case, the thing is that the material selected was uh, 395. Um, this material could be improved if, I mean, these losses could be improved if we change the material. And this was what we did. We basically, um, went for a material that were, was able to provide uh, lower losses uh, at this temperature, which was 3C98. Um, by doing this change, we were able to now uh, meet the, the, the requirement and be in the, in the right efficiency range. Um, so, well, here you have uh, some references. Um, this is now uh, all from my part. And now we will go through the, through the, um, to the questions that, that you might have. So please feel free to ask um, whatever you want and I will try to, to give you my best answer.
So there is one question. Um, what should be the criteria to select between various types of core like PQ, PM, EE, uh, et cetera? So here, um, it depends on application and, and on the cost target. So if you are looking, for instance, for a very cost, very low cost, then you should look for e cores. Um, and if you look for, a, a, let's say, high performance, uh, probably you are looking for a PQ core. Um, that's normally the, the case. So round, round center pole normally is more expensive than, than square ones. Uh, that's, that's one of the points there. Um, yeah, that would be my, 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 let's say, answer to that. Now, how do you calculate each individual thermal resistance? This is a, a, a good question. Um, the, this is, this is uh, what I saw here is, let's say, uh, a complex thing behind. Uh, there is a model proposed by the ETH uh, several years ago where they derive all this explanation. It's on the references on this presentation. Uh, which we will publish. So if you look at the reference, you can see there how all those uh, thermal resistance can be derived. Uh, but basically you need to have a lot of things into account. Um, yeah, you, you can see that there. Um, then there is another question, um, which is again the same, how can you, I mean, if we can elaborate on the thermal model, um, Again, I would recommend you to go to this uh, to this ETH uh, ETH paper and, and take a look at it because there is all the explanation on how to derive the, um, the thermal resistance of of this network. Um, there is another question here: If the magnetizing inductance of the LLC transformer is very low due to the sign criteria then how do we meet such a low value of LM? At the end, when it comes to the magnetizing inductance, you need to put a gap. The thing is that if the value is very, very, very low, then you will need a huge gap. So at the end, the solution is to put distributed gaps. Um, but then there is a point that maybe even, even with that, you don't meet that requirement because the gap is so large. And then what I would say is that you need to rethink if, if you are targeting either the right magnetizing inductance or either the right core. So if you have a big core area, you will have a huge gap. Um, so maybe you need to go for a core with less area. That would be my, my recommendation. Um, there is another comment that you mean, you mentioned split bobbin leads to higher winding losses. Um, if I can elaborate on that, yes. So at the end, um, when you have two windings, one on top of the other, um, and so if you have an interleaving structure, then you have uh, the, let's say the proximity losses is between the windings is, is reduced because you have some it's feeling its direction of the wire. But when you have all the primary and all the secondary, this is not the case. So let's say the, the Compensation there is not happening, and that is why we you you have uh, more winding losses. Um, there is a, another question which is you mentioned reinforced isolation, uh, OVC two and pollution degree two, which is the standard you uh, use to design. Um, at the end here it depends on the application. So for instance in automotive you have the IEC sixty one fifty five eight. Um, but normally what you can take a look at is at the basic safety standard uh, IEC 60664, which is the basic standard for, for uh, magnetics, but there are other specific standards for depending on application, like for consumer electronics or, um, or other uh, applications. Um, which approach is better, increasing the gap in the core to reduce flux density? or moving to higher core? Um, this question, I mean, you need to do the trade-off on the losses, uh, both in the core and the winding. I mean, it's not a straightforward answer. Um, if you can manage to have reasonable losses with a single core, this is gonna be, uh, well, with a smaller core, this is gonna be better always. So I would say that you need to analyze uh, case by case. 
Um, well, there is another question about selection of magnetizing inductance and series inductance for duality bridge. We will cover this on another webinar. Um, there is another question. When do you calculate the number of turns to, uh, when you calculate the number of turns, do you take account the gain of the LLC? Um, yes, this is a good question. Uh, when you calculate the number of turns based on your core loss target and your magnetizing inductance, um, you always need to look at the ratio you have in the transformer. So if, if for instance, your ratio is 10 to one, then uh, one important thing is that if the optimal number of turns is uh, 12, then you might need to, to, to rethink or reshape the converter because uh, 12 to one is not 10 to one. So this is a good question and it's, it's really important, especially when you have very high turns ratio. So if your turns ratio is 1.4, 1.5, 2.5, uh, you, you can really adjust uh, the turns ratio uh, by doing, for instance, uh, I don't know, 15 to 8. There you have a lot of game uh, to play. But if the ratio is very high, 10 to 1, 20 to 1, um, 8 to 1, then you are more restrict. So you need to take a look at the turns in the primary side, uh, divide by the ratio, and see if you get the value that you need. And if not, I think it is if it is better to have a different core or to adapt your converter requirements. Um, so there is another question: What maximum current density do you do you work? And do you use six amperes per millimeter for forced air cooling? Uh, here again, it depends it depends on its specific uh, case and magnetic. Um, normally, I would recommend for no convection four to five amperes per square millimeter. Um, and then you can go up to 10 or 12 if you have uh, air cooling. I mean, air cooling is, 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 is really good if you have the air really facing the winding. This is also impor important to mention. Um, but yes, you can go above six amperes per square millimeter. Um, uh, there is another question, how to calculate the peak of the magnetic flux in an integrated LLC transformer. Um, at the end, you, you need to always take into account the, the peak voltage that your transformer is seeing. And actually I'm going to set again my screen because this is a really good question that it, it is really important. Um, so here, I'm going back. Um, I'm going to share my screen again. So here, when when it comes to the to the um, to the transformer, it is really really important uh, for the LLC to if you are going for a leakage integration to take the voltage here uh, after the capacitor because this voltage would be much higher than the voltage seen here. Uh, let's say in, in the terminals of the transformer. Um, so it is, this is really important. One, one of the decisions that you need to make when designing this type of transformer, that is if the leakage is integrated, the voltage that you should take for the core loss assessment is the one seen here. Um, and the, the, let's say, I don't know if I am pointing this out. So I'm gonna try to show it. Well, here in between the, in, in, let's say the beginning of the inductor uh, and this point here, and if not, um, you need to take the one in the transformer. And there is a significant difference, especially at the low frequency point. Uh, the voltage seen at the transformer uh, starts to be uh, like this, okay? So this means that you have a significant amount of voltage, whether if the leakage is not integrated, this is more a square wave. So the, let's say volts per microsecond is much smaller. And this is important and it should be considered uh, in the design. Um, another question, which is considered to make a first choice for the least strand diameter? I mean, besides the switching frequency and the skin effect cost, you need to know, well, first is, what is your switching frequency and what is the, how many harmonics you have? Because you might be running 
at uh, 50 kilohertz, but maybe you have a lot of harmonics, harmonics in a very high frequency range. So imagine, I don't know, uh, 300 kilohertz. Um, and then you need to, to, to know that those high frequency harmonics are going to, to give us significant amount of losses. So you should take into account the uh, least strand diameter looking at the whole the wall harmonic spectrum. This is one point. The second point is the cost. I mean, the smaller the strand diameter, the larger the cost of the, or the bigger the cost of the of the wire. Um, and even at some points, if it's a very, very small, it's not gonna be feasible even for soldering. So yeah, I would say those are the three things to take a look at. Um, there is a really, uh, Good question. How do you calculate the leakage inductance uh, when using a ferrite or in between the windings? Um, so here uh, there are different uh, there are different methods. Uh, you can run finite element analysis, or you can derive your own model that can be done by if you know the H field in in all the winding, and you do the proper reluctance model, then you can. Um, get uh, the leakage estimation, and this is something we are uh, working at Frenetic to have uh, to have in our tool um, uh, soon. Um, can you give an analogy to distinguish losses and efficiency? Can you explain green line and blue bar in slide six? So. I'm going back to the slides. Um, so here, okay. So this blue is the efficiency of the converter. So this means I have a 60 watt power converter where the efficiency is 93%. Now out of this 93% uh, of efficiency, um, let's say I'm losing one third of the losses in the transformer. So this means 33% of the losses of the total loss is in the transformer. And this is the transformer efficiency. So the transformer is 98% efficiency, but uh, overall it takes 33%. So let's put some numbers. If I can lose 10 bats, I lose 3.3 .3 in the transformer. Overall, out of the total efficiency, of the converter, it would be 98% of efficiency of the transformer, but uh, with respect to the total loss budget, you are losing 30%. That's how this plot should be uh, interpreted. Um, some more questions? Does anyone know? Does anyone know? Does an integrated resonant tank add losses to the total transformer losses? I mean, when you integrate the inductance as the leakage inductance, what you have is a poor couplet. So this means high proximity losses. So this means more losses in the windings. And because you have more voltage seen at the transformer, you have also more core losses. This is how it should be, uh, I mean, how we should look at this. Um, how big is, is, is the impact of this? Um, it should be analyzed case by case. It's not the same if you do a 100 watt LLC that if you do a 25 kilowatt LLC, uh, the impact of, of the integration should be seen in case by case. Um, okay, some more questions. Is there any rule of thumb for maximum gap versus core size? So let me uh, try to answer this one. Um, I'm gonna share my screen again. And for this one, I'm going to open forensic line. So, well, this is a forensic line. Um, here, what you can see is where is, uh, we have a specific core, actually the core that I saw in the presentation. And we have uh, the gap. 
Now, how do you know if that gap is too large or too small? Um, you need to know what is the fringing field factor. And there are some equations for this that uh, we can um, we can show this uh, on a on a separate webinar. Um, and based on this fringing field factor, you know if the if the gap is too big or not. So the bigger this number, this means that uh, the the gap is is being too too high. Um, the bigger the gap, the more uh, losses you will have uh, in the windings. So to give to give a, a reference or what I would recommend you is take a look at the fringing field factor equations, um, and then you need to know for your core what is your fringing field factor. If this goes above one point, I mean if this is be, be, between one point two and one point six, this is already let's say a big gap or but it's something manageable. If you go above one point six, then the gap is going to be too large uh, for the for the component. Um, but let's say it's not possible to say like one millimeter because it depends at the end on the size of the core. Um, there is here. Okay. I'm operating an LLC in both modes. Pulse skipping. Do I need to keep this in mind while designing the transformer? Yes, at the end, whenever you design a transformer, you always take into account, I mean, you need to take into account all the um, operating conditions. So the more you take into account before doing the design, the better it's going to be the design. So definitely, yes, if you can, I mean, if you know how are going to be the waveforms in this burst mode, then I would strongly recommend to take it into account. Well, then uh, there is another question. Can we have the parameters of the core during the simulation? Uh, do you have the different core manufacturers? In our case, in Frenetic Online, we have many different type of cores, actually all the catalog and even the possibility to customize the cores. And uh, we have also different uh, ferrite core suppliers like uh, Ferroscue, TDK or others, and also the possibility to add uh, materials. Um, then, uh, When do you, there is another question, when you do interleaving winding, where can we put the winding with high power? Uh, I understand that by high power, you mean a high current or that is not an auxiliary winding. Um, so normally, normally, if you think about this, um, the high current winding will have a bigger, diameter uh, than the small one. So when it comes to manufacturing, it is easier to have the thinner white diameter in the inner layer, so the big one falls on top of it. If you do it the other way around, then the inner one uh, can go in between the two turns of the, let's say, um, bigger wire diameter. So I would normally recommend uh, to put the high current winding with the bigger wire diameter in between the um, winding with the smaller current uh, wire diameter. Uh, there is one question, what is the optimized resonant frequency of the LLC converter for a smaller transformer design? I mean, this is a very generic question. Uh, you need to see the whole operation of the of the converter um, and the power I mean this is uh, the, the complete converter operation should be should be analyzed and it's not possible to to say anything without looking at the at the whole operating range is there a practical approach to choose the tunes ratio um, well the tunes ratio selected is more a converter level thing. Um, I would strongly recommend you to take a look at the TI, TI reference design uh, or the application notes. They have a couple of really, really good application notes about the LLC um, design there. You can see how the tune ratio is arrived. But at the end, you, you need to take into account the output voltage 
range, so minimum output voltage, maximum output voltage, and input voltage range, and based on those, you take the tunes ratio. Then when it comes to the transformer design, uh, I would strongly recommend to always uh, try to, uh, to do a trade-off and benefit the transformer. So don't try to put so many turns just to meet the turns ratio, because maybe you are just making the transformer much worse. Um, yeah, that would be my recommendation. And then there is another question about the, the link of this video. Uh, yes, in principle, this video will be available online. Uh, you will just be, be uh, look at our LinkedIn because probably we will publish there. And then there is another question, how to calculate the losses in CBS capacitors. Um, I'm sorry, uh, this, uh, today I came to talk about the transformer. I'm not an expert on the capacitor uh, zero voltage switching. So I guess uh, maybe uh, someone from the capacitor field industry should be able to, to answer that one. Um, well, I see there is no more questions. So that's all for today. Uh, I hope you enjoy this, this webinar today. Um, we, will, we will have another webinar next month. So, uh, see you there. Um, bye.